So uh, I had originally chosen uh, a few other topics to speak on, and I had uh, a whole list of things, probably about five or six different topics that I had chosen. And then uh, several weeks ago, Paul and I had been chatting on Facebook, and uh, I think it was something, uh, I think it was following something he had just posted on his blog. I don't remember the exact circumstances, but, um, but I had been sitting there thinking about this, and this thought came to me that... Um, Believers don't really know who they are. Believers don't know who they are. And, and like I said, this was, this was prompted by a conversation that Paul and I have been talking, have been having on Facebook. But I, I was overwhelmed by the realization of this and how profound this was. That here we are, some, what, 2,000 years after, uh, if you want to call it the birth of the church or the birth of Christianity, uh, some 500 years after the Reformation, and what do we have? We've got these grand churches with their grand buildings and their building programs and these huge budgets. We've got Christian schools, Christian day schools, Christian universities, We've got hundreds of se uh, uh, seminaries churning out all these pastors. As Christians, we've got all these resources at our disposal. And, and even more so today, with, it, with living in this internet age, we've got all these resources at our disposal. And with all of this, people are still sitting in churches... Sunday after Sunday. And they still don't even know who they are. Or what they are. They're not aware of the reality of their existence as believers. And what this really boils down to is this philosophy of existence. Who are we? What are we? And, and I don't want to delve into the, a, a fundamental discussion about what is man. Uh, that's a very esoteric subject, and it's not, it, not that it's not worthy of discussion, but that's not something I want to get into in any depth here. It's, it's kind of going to take me off topic, but, and I've only got so much time here, but I want to focus on something more specific. And specifically, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? You remember that it was in Antioch, in the province of Syria. It was in Antioch where they first coined this term Christian. But it wasn't in a good way, was it? It was a pejorative. It was a pejorative term. And apparently the society in Antioch was such that they liked to come up with these pejorative terms for people, and they did so with Christians. Um, it was meant as an insult. In fact, in the Greek, if you look at the word in the Greek, it actually, it literally translates Christ ones. Okay? Christ ones. Or we could even make it sound more derogatory by calling, by saying Christers. Okay? You know, we've heard people say, you're one of those Christers, aren't you? Okay. Um, one who goes around talking about Christ. It was meant to be an insult. And in fact, every time you see the word Christian used in the New Testament, and it's not very often, the word Christian doesn't appear in the New Testament very often. It's generally used in this negative context. So, of course, the fact that it was meant as an insult is what caused the term to become adopted as a badge of honor in later decades and centuries in sort of an ironic fashion. Um, and even to this day, the word Christian is very common and normal, and it doesn't carry the stigma 
with it that it once did in the first century. People in churches gladly call themselves Christians. And now granted, in, you know, in recent years, there's been this growing intolerance of what passes for Christianity. Uh, but for many, many years, that wasn't the case. For many, many, many parts of the, you know, even, even this most recent century, going back, you know, 1900s, um, it was popular to be a Christian. But we've seen, and I'd say probably in the last maybe 10 years or more, probably, you know, probably more than that, you've got this growing animosity towards Christians once again. And it's not necessarily for the reasons that we think of immediately. Uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is this conflict between government and religion and the whole separation of church and state issue. But more and more, I see that as being a secondary issue. What we really have is a growing hatred for those who call themselves Christians because of what they represent. And that is, on this institutional level, on this theological level, and even on a philosophical level, it has to do with the seeming indifference to abuse and suffering. An indifference to abuse and suffering both inside and outside the institution. Christians are viewed as uncaring and, un and insensitive. You have Hollywood actors being interviewed in, on television, going out and referring to God as being a sadistic monster. And I can't necessarily blame them for that. You look at the way that Christians behave, especially towards each other, and if you don't believe me, okay, you watch what happens when you try to ask a question on, in a Sunday school class. You ask a question that, that, that questions the orthodox position, or you try to leave a church over doctrinal matters, and see how many of those people that you thought were your friends, people that you thought you had a close relationship with, and you see how many of them still continue to have contact with you. Or you watch how downright vicious they get when you try to present a rational argument with them in a Facebook discussion. One has to ask themselves, if they treat, if they treat a fellow brother like that, if they treat a fellow believer like that, how, how are they going to treat a lost person? How do they treat someone they're going to try to evangelize? And you don't think the world sees this? You don't think that the world looks at that behavior, and then we, and then we wonder why in the world unsaved people don't want to have anything to do with us? You know, what, what did Jesus say? In John 13, 35, Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye what? If ye love one another. If ye love one another. Does the world see us loving each other? How can they believe anything we have to say? How can they believe us? Dear lost person, I want to share the gospel with you because I love you. Oh, like you love that other guy? Like that you like like you love that other guy who calls himself a Christian? I see the way you treated him. I see the things you called him. Just because he disagreed with you on something. I saw the way you treated him. And the blame for this rests squarely on Augustinian Reformed Protestant Orthodoxy. Traditional orthodoxy has created this God in its own image that is, without a doubt, a sadistic monster. That's the God they've created. And that's the God that they expect us to present to the world. And so as a result, you have followers of this God 
going around treating people the exact same way that they believe their God treats them. So why should we expect any different? And this is the reason that the term Christian has become a pejorative once again. And it's for this reason why I don't call myself a Christian. I don't refer to myself as a Christian anymore. I call myself a believer. Susan's nodding her head. I call myself a believer or a follower of Christ or a disciple of Christ. Okay? In the first century, they were known as followers of the way. All right? I prefer believer. So along those same lines then, this becomes, this becomes the foundational premise for why those who call themselves Christians don't even know who they are anymore. What is the primary defining term, I'm going to ask you this, okay, what is the primary defining term that traditional orthodoxy uses today and has used for centuries that, to determine our identity as a believer? Okay? When you sit in that pew, or when you sit in that stadium chair, or whatever kind of seats your church uses, and the pastor, elder, bishop, apostle, or whatever he wants to call himself, he stands in front of that plexiglass, plexiglass podium, and he's standing up there, and he's looking so hip with his goatee or his soul patch or whatever kind of facial hair he's got, and he's in his blue jeans and his turtleneck and sports coat and brown suede shoes, and he starts to deliver his sermon, what is the one theme that is driven home to you over and over and over and over and over again? What does he want you to know about yourself? What are you? I don't know if the people online can see this or not. But what does it say? Sinner. 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 This is the theme. This is what defines you. It's in the songs we sing. Only a sinner saved by grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, wretch like me. I need thee every hour. Okay? I could go on and on and on. Okay? I could go around the room here and ask each one of you, you know, Name a hymn for me, okay? Or a song, all right? We see it in these pithy little memes on Facebook. Here's one I saw recently. I'm not a Christian because I am strong and have it all together. I'm a Christian because I am weak and admit I need a Savior. I've seen this one go around several times in the last few weeks. Of course, the, you know, the question we should immediately ask ourselves, what's the question we need to ask ourselves? Why do Christians need a Savior? Because they're Protestants. Why do Christians need a Savior? And I ask someone that question. Why do, why does, if I'm a Christian, why do I need a Savior? If I'm already saved. <clears throat> okay? you know, but we never ask those questions. Nobody ever asks those questions. Here's another one. I'm not that perfect Christian. I'm the one who knows I need Jesus. And of course, there's a subtle snarkiness to that if you look carefully. I'm not that perfect Christian. I'm the one who knows I need Jesus. You know, and, you know, it's almost uh, trying to convey a kind of holier than thou attitude. You know, it almost it almost seems to contradict the very humility that it's trying to convey. Uh, I'm so humble that I know I'm not perfect, but at the same time, I know something you don't know. Okay, and I know note, I need Jesus, and you don't. And note that they're still under the standard of perfection. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're under law. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. You know, of course, you know, and at first glance, no one's going to argue with this stuff. You know, no one's going to argue with this. Um, how can you say you don't need Jesus? 
who's going to argue with that? You know? But what they don't realize is that, well, wait a second, believers already have Jesus. We're already saved. Why do I need a Savior over and over? You know, but you'll see this. You'll see this all the time, all over the place. Don't forget, Christian, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Don't forget it. Now, of course, what do they mean by that? Well, they state, well, I still sin. Right? They like to ask that question. Did you sin today? Did you sin today? And, of course, you know, then you're a sinner. Right? Because you sin today. You know, and of course they think that they trick, they, they think they trick you when they ask that question. They think they're being so clever. You know, if you come to them with some notion of righteousness, and then of course their mistake then, right there, is equating righteousness with obeying the law. Okay? But the fundamental flaw in this assumption about being a sinner is this. If you make this your assumption, that because you sin, therefore you're a sinner. What you are doing is you are allowing your identity to be defined by a practice or a behavior. Let me say that again. You are allowing your identity to be defined by a practice or a behavior. Okay? Now on a certain level, that's not necessarily incorrect. This is something we do all the time. In our everyday life, we tend to categorize ourselves and others by what we do. Okay, we do this in our jobs. Okay? I have my own business. I earn my living by cooking food. So since that is the behavior in which I engage, I can legitimately say, I am a cook. Right? Okay? Or Paul writes for a blog. So Paul is a blogger, okay? Or Cam Newton plays football for the Carolina Panthers. Therefore, Cam Newton is a football player. And I threw that one in for Zach, but Zach's not here, so he'll have to catch that one later when, he's, when he listens to it later, okay? But all of these are examples of behaviors or activities that we use to categorize each other and to compare ourselves with others and that helps us organize our world. And so all of these things are true, but, we, but, but do those, are those the things that define us as individuals? In other words, aren't we more than just a cook or a blogger or a football player? There's this, to, there's this tendency to divide people up into groups and we call them communities and these so-called communities are defined by the behaviors and actions of those who would then identify with them. And so ultimately what ends up happening is you have those who say that they're part of this community or they're part of that community, as if everything they are, uh, who they are, is defined by the behaviors that are common to those in that community. Okay? The LGBT crowd is a great example of this. Okay, how do they refer to themselves? They like to say the LGBT community. They attach that word community to the end of this. Well, the LGBT community this. Okay, the LGBT community that. Okay, well, what does that mean? What they're essentially saying is everything they are, their whole identity is wrapped up in a specific behavior. Now, I'm not going to get into, uh, is this a choice? Or are they born that way? That's, that's irrelevant to the point. Okay? Even if you assume that you're born this way, it's still a behavior, and you are choosing that behavior to be the basis of your identity. Why don't we do this with other behaviors? You know, why don't we have a pedophile community? Why don't we talk about the serial killer community? Or the alcoholic community? Okay, And I'll stop there with that because I don't want to go too far and have the analogy fall apart on me. But I think you should begin to, to see the point I'm trying to make here is we don't define ourselves by behaviors. Okay, And this has tremendous ramifications. 
So how do we define ourselves? And I think a great place to start is asking, how does God define himself? Is God defined? You know, we've got, there's all these attributes for God. We say God's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's immutable, he's, God is love, God is just, he's all of these things. Um, is God defined by these attributes? You know, is, is that how God is defined? Or are these, are, are all these abstract concepts that man has assigned to God to help organize his world around him? And so we create these aspects of God so that we can try to understand him? How did God define himself? Did God define himself? Okay. Moses asked the same question, if you remember, at the burning bush. Moses was the, he was to be the leader of Israel. And he's having this conversation with God at the burning bush. And he was concerned that he would go to the children of Israel and they wouldn't believe him. They wouldn't follow him. And he asked God, who are you? Who, who do I tell them sent me? Remember? And what did God say in Exodus Chapter 3, verse 14, God answers Moses, and he said, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. When God said, I am that I am, what was God saying? God said, I exist. God said, I exist. Do you realize what a profound declaration that is? God was not just being coy with Moses here. Okay? In this simple three-word declaration in Hebrew, God was establishing the fundamental definition of self. I exist. Who am I? I am me. I am who I am. I exist. That is such a profound declaration. To declare, to declare your own existence is to acknowledge your right to self. But there's even more to this. And I was, I, and I was having this discussion with Zach uh, last week. And I was pointing this out to him. And, and he pointed out to me, and I agree, that along with... This, when God said, I exist, there's a corollary to that truth. When God declared, I exist, at the same time he said, you exist. You exist. To recognize self also means to recognize the existence of other selves. And this is especially profound when we consider that God made man in his image. That God is self also means that man is self. And so that man can also legitimately declare, I exist. I am. And because man can declare this, he must also, he must also recognize other selves. So if we truly understand this, we can see that man cannot be legitimately defined by actions or behaviors. He can only be defined as self. He is who he is. Who am I? I'm me. You are you. That's who I am. That's the definition of my existence. You can categorize me any way you want, but that's not who I am. And I'll let you ponder all the ramifications of that. But this is where we have to start before we can even begin to discuss who we are as believers. What it means to be born again. Because first and foremost, we are creatures made in God's image, whether we are born again or not. Do you get that? Whether we're born again or not, we are creatures in God, made in God's image. And everything I just said has to be true of all mankind. Not just, not just regenerated believers, unregenerate man. 
it has to be true of every man, all, all mankind. We have to begin with the right assumption about man in general. And, you know, we talked about that a little bit last night. Right? Only, it's only when we have the right assumption about man that we can have a valid discussion and understanding about who we are as believers. So, that was a big, long introduction. And so I'm finally getting ready to get into the meat of this whole topic. But that was some necessary groundwork. So as believers, who are we really? If we're not defined as sinners, if we're not defined by behavior, how are we defined then? What does the Bible have to say about it? And I want to start with this one right here. Born again. This single statement by the Apostle Paul is the single most emphatic statement regarding the reality of the new birth. Right here. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In fact, the, the, the structure of this verse in the Greek is very interesting. I did a word study on this one time. And I'm not going to get into that in any depth right now because, um, like I said, it's, it's, there's a lot to this. And I could spend a whole session on just breaking this verse apart this verse alone apart. But the grammatical structure of this verse is very interesting, but there's a couple things I want to point out here. Most obvious in this verse is this contrast that Paul uses between old and new. And I'm going to speak in depth on this contrast in the next session tomorrow, but I want you to see here that the words that Paul uses to express this contrast. First of all, the old things. Paul uses a word here that is rarely used for old. When you see that word old, it's a word that's not normally used in the Old Testament, or excuse me, in the New Testament. In the New Testament, there's another Greek word for old, and it's this first one right here, palios. Okay? Palios. This is the word that's most frequently used. In other words, when you're reading through the New Testament and you see the word old in your Bibles, most of the time it's going to be this word right here, palios. And what's worth noting here about this word is that there is an age aspect involved to this. Okay, okay. This, is, uh, this is old with respect to age. I might say, my grandfather is old. Okay, my car is old. All right, I'm talking about it being old in years, okay, or months, or days, or whatever. Okay? And like I said, I'll talk about this more in the next session. But in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17, Paul uses a different word for old. And it's the second word right here, archaea. Archaea. Archaea means original, that which was from the beginning, the former. Okay, so this word old, this is the old that's not with respect to age, but with, with respect to comparison. Okay? Someone might talk about his old school, or his old job, or his old girlfriend. And I know the girlfriend might not like being referred to as old, okay? but in this context, we mean former or previous. You got that? Okay. So this is the idea behind this word archaea. So when Paul is talking about the old things, he's talking about the former things or the previous things. Now this is going to be important to understand later on when we talk about this again in session two. Okay? So I, I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay? Because there's a time aspect involved that we're in that we were referring to something that was in the past, but we are not specifically re referencing the age of something. Okay, So keep this in mind. We're differentiating between previous or former things 
versus the age of something. Okay? So Paul contrasts these old things or the former things or these previous things with new things. And he says, all things have become new. And the word new there is this word kainos. Kainos. This means new with respect to freshness as opposed to age. Okay? Different. A replacement. Okay? So he got a new job. My son transferred to a new school. He has a new girlfriend. Okay? Do you see the meaning there? Do you see the difference? Okay? See the comparison we're making? We're not talking about the age of something. When I say he got a new job, I don't mean he got a job that didn't exist before. Okay? Although it could, that could be the case. You know? it, but, but fundamentally, I'm referring to it being different. Okay? Different from the one he had before. Okay? All right? Um, this word presents the perfect inverse comparison with archaea. All right? It's a comparison not of age, but to indicate a difference or distinction between the two. He left his old job, he started a new job. He left his old school, he's going to a new school. Not that one was just not that it was just built, but a different school. He broke up with his old girlfriend, he's dating a new girlfriend. Okay? Not one that was just, okay, we don't want to say born, I guess, because that wouldn't be right, okay? <laughs> Let's hope not, okay? But you get the idea, okay? This, it's a profound distinctiveness. Uh, there, is, there is nothing that remains of the former, okay? You don't keep any of it around for sentimental reasons. It's not like you took that which was former and restored it somehow, okay, or rehabilitated it, right. all right? No, you've completely eliminated it, okay? You've completely eliminated the former, the previous, in exchange for a different one, okay? You have something that is different from what you used to have, and this, this is the description of the new birth. Jesus taught this very thing. In the middle of the night, a Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus to ask him questions about his teaching. And, of course, he came in the middle of the night because he didn't want to be seen talking with Jesus. It wouldn't have been a good thing for him as a Pharisee to be seen talking with Jesus. But Nicodemus was generally interested in what Jesus had to say. And almost immediately, Jesus responds to Nicodemus by teaching him about the new birth. He says in John 3, and I don't know if you can see this on the, <clears throat> on the video or not, but in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, it reads this, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now this expression that Jesus uses is two words in the Greek. And it's the expression, Genao anothen. Genao anothen. And literally it reads, to be born on high, or to be born from above. That's what genao anothen means. Now Peter takes this same expression that Jesus uses, born from above, and he takes that idea with the proper understanding of it, and he uses a completely different word altogether. He takes the word genao this first part here, this word genao, and he combines that with a prefix ana, which if you take the prefix ana and use it all by itself, ana means up. It's a, it's a preposition meaning up. But 
when you put when you attach it to the beginning of a word as a prefix, it has the meaning of repetition or intensity. So in 1 Peter 1.23, Peter uses this word anagonao. Anagonao literally means to be born again or to be reborn. So in 1 Peter 1.23, it reads, being born again, that's the word anagonao, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. These are the only two passages in the New Testament that use that you'll see this expression born again. And it's important for believers to realize that they are born again. Why? How is it significant regarding the believer's identity? Well, here it is. Being born again is the basis for righteousness. Okay? I mean, let's run through this again. Why did Jesus die? Jesus died. Did he, did he die on the cross to shed his blood to be a covering for our sin? No. No. He died to end the law. Specifically, the law of sin and death. Jesus didn't cover our sin. He took it away as far as the east is from the west. What did John the baptizer say when he saw Jesus coming? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God which covers the sin of the world. What did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay? Taketh away. This, this is the imagery of the scapegoat from Leviticus 16. You all familiar with that? The scapegoat in Leviticus 16. The priest would have two goats and he would throw a dice, he would cast a lot of some kind, and whichever lot fell on whichever goat, one goat would be sacrificed, and its blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, and the other goat, which is the scapegoat, he would lay his hand on that goat in a symbolic gesture of placing all of the sins of Israel, placing them upon that goat. And then they would take, a strong man would take that goat into the wilderness and release that goat, and the goat would run away. It would escape. And, that, and, the, and the imagery there is of those, those, that goat carrying with it all of the sins, taking them away, far, far away, never to be, never to be seen again. Okay? That's what Jesus did on the cross. Okay? He ended the law. He took away our sins. Okay? They aren't covered. They're gone. Okay? Because what happens when we believe? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the old man, Archaea, dies. The old man that was under the law is dead. The law can't touch him anymore. He was crucified with Christ. And a new man is resurrected in his place. A new man is reborn. The old law of sin and death can't touch him. And where there is no law, there is no sin. And where there is no sin, there is no condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is no condemnation for the new man. There is no condemnation for the one who is born again because there is no sin, because there is no law to condemn him. And I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself. We could go round and round and round, but I want this to be clear. I want you to get this. Now, that wasn't exciting enough. Consider this. You tell any of this to your Protestant Reformed friends. You tell them you're righteous. You, can, you tell them you're righteous. Not just positionally righteous, not just forensically righteous or declared righteous, but you tell them you are righteous. That's your identity, righteous. Righteous because you are born again. And what are they going to say to you? We're back to this again. Did you sin today? We're right back to this again. Did you sin today? And they're so smug when they say that. 
They say it just like, gotcha. I gotcha. You know, uh-huh, see? And what, do you, and what happens if you say no? No, I didn't sin. Then what do they do? They're going to immediately pull out 1 John 1a. Okay? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay, of course, that's a proof text taken out of context. But they won't hear you on that because it doesn't fit in with their reality. Okay, remember, what is their reality? What is man? For that matter, what are believers? Sinners. Sinners. To them, that's our identity. But let me show you something else John said in this same epistle. And I tell you, I've read this passage in 1 John so many times, and I've struggled with it. And I was preparing this lesson, and I had one of those light bulb moments. It just went, boop. You know, it, could, it even made that sound, too. Boop. You know? <laughs> but I read this, and my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, the reality of what I had just read thrilled me. And I'm like, of course, that's it, of course. It makes perfect sense. Now let me show you this. Look at 1 John 3, 8. 1 John, let me start with this one. Because this is the contrast. 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this is the purpose of the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And of course, I'm reading this from King James. But the Reformed Protestant crowd has a hard time with this verse. They have a really hard time with this verse. Because that verse would suggest, if you read it just like it says, in it's plain, literal meaning, that would suggest that believer, if believers still sin, we're of the devil. And we're not really saved. They don't know what to do with that verse. So what do they do? They reinterpret it. In fact, the ESV, if you read this same verse in the English Standard Version, which is the Reformed Bible, they completely retranslate that verse. And it says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning. So the idea is... Yeah, the believer sins, but he doesn't really make a practice of sinning. It's not his practice. He still sins, but it's, it's not a practice that he cares. That he, so, so the idea here is a, you know, like a, a perpetual continuing sin. It's just like you slip up every now and then. It's not something you, that's habitual. That's how they interpret this. Which, if you think about it, it's still an outright contradiction. Because according to them, and you know, John's talking about determinism, if it's our nature to sin, then we can't help it anyway. So calling it a practice means that somehow you can choose not to. You know, so this is just one more example of the blatant hypocrisy in Reformed doctrine. They play these word games with the text, and then they try to get you to think that they don't really mean what they say. Okay? So this is what verse 8 says, but contrast that with what verse 9 says. We come to verse 9, and this is where the light bulb went on. Remember, we're working, to, we're working with the conclusion, okay? We've come to the conclusion, where there is no law, there is no sin. Did you sin today? You can make the most emphatic statement, you can state most emphatically, no. Why? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Do you realize what that says? The reality of this verse is incredible. John says plainly, a born-again believer does not sin. Not only that, he cannot sin. Is this talking about ability? 
One might think so, but think about what this verse has to do with the law. Where there is no law, there is no sin, right? Okay? The believer cannot sin because there is no sin. Duh! <laughs> and that was the light bulb moment. For, that's what I said when I read that. I'm like, duh! If there's no sin, of course he can't sin. This is yet another contrast between the old and the new. Verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 is the old. Okay? This is the old. Okay? Before you were born again, look at, before you were born again, you committed sin because you were under law. Got it? The law condemned you. Therefore, you were of the devil. But that was then. That old passed away, the previous, the former. It was replaced with the new, something different. You were reborn, and the law was ended, and sin was taken away. Therefore, you can no longer sin, because there is no sin. Got it? But it doesn't end there. John goes on, and later on in the letter, he says the exact same thing again. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Again, this is talking about the new birth. Who is the one that begat? That would be God the Father. Okay? We are born of God. Not only do we love the one who begat us, okay, not only do we love the Father, but we also love others. We love everyone else who is also born again. Okay, and we'll talk about this some more later on in the next session as well. So we have the reality of the new birth once again here. But then he continues. Look at verse 18 in the same chapter. 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. There it is again. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Do you see how all of this so wonderfully fits together? You're talking about the puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times I read 1 John 3, 9, and I didn't know what to do with that verse because it, it didn't make any sense. And now, But you put that piece together with the piece about the, about the law being ended and where there is no law, there is no sin, this all fits together just like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Okay? How wonderfully consistent this is when we understand it all in context. There's no conflict here. We don't have to twist the words to make it fit. We don't have to... We don't have to do any kind of theological or mental gymnastics. It's logically consistent. Okay? This is the reason why believers are righteous. This is why we can say without a doubt, nope, I didn't sin today. Because I can't sin. I'm not condemned today. Is there anything in the word study that would indicate sin is a pattern? Or no? I think you really have to make a stretch to do it. I so really it's do. an assumption. I think you really have to look. I was never, I, as many times as I've seen that word translated as, being a pra, as practicing sin, I look at it in the Greek. And I think you really have to make a stretch to interpret that meaning to be practicing sin. I think it, it's so much easier this way. You don't have to, you don't have to, my point is you don't have to try and reinterpret the word. It says what it says. And then you know, elsewhere, did you know John, I mean? John says all transgressions are against the law. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. In the so, general facility, yeah. Yeah. And see, that's, this is the reality that we're talking about when it comes right down to it. You know, sin has, sin has to do with condemnation and judgment. 
Their reality says that when you sin, you need another covering to keep you from being condemned. Mm -hmm. But you see, that's what they don't get about it. They don't get this. Okay? So, what is our identity as believers? Are we sinners? No. We're born again. We are righteous. We cannot sin because there is no sin. The law was ended. Our sins were taken away. We are truly righteous by virtue of the new birth. Do you see how important this is to understand? This, this, this one reality alone is so liberating, isn't it? Once believers come to the realization of who they are because of the new birth and what that actually means, that's got to be such an encouragement to get out from underneath this burden of being constantly reminded, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, and to suddenly realize, no, wait a second, I cannot sin. I cannot sin. You know, how tremendously freeing that has to be for someone who's been told otherwise all their life. You know, and so, so that's where I'm going to stop for this session. And we'll look at some more examples of the believer's identity tomorrow in session two. Um, does anybody have any other comments or questions? Things you want to add? When you say you cannot sin, you're not talking about our natures have changed to be sin sinless and perfect. That doesn't happen until um, we're glorified, right? What I'm talking about is what it has to do with regard to the law and condemnation. Right. That's, and that's the point, and that's exactly, that's the point that John is, that's the exact point that John is making when he made that statement. Because John understood that. You know, where there is no law, there is no sin, so if there's no sin, I can't sin. Right? I'm not under the law, I can't sin. Again, all verses have to be interpreted uh, in regard to their context of justification or sanctification. Mm -hmm. In regard to justification, we are perfect. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's no law. And the guy that was under the law is dead and gone, and now we aren't a revision. Mm -hmm. We're new, mm -hmm. like you said, different. Right. In fact, we're not only different, all things are different, mm -hmm. okay? Um, including sin. We no longer sin against justification. Now we sin against God as Father, and we see that in the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, our Father who art in heaven, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But that prayer is to God as Father. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, um, yeah, I, um, before this, you bringing this up, I was more inclined to see that even though you know how, um, uh, you know, hard I hold to the, to the law gospel construct mm -hmm. of, you know, the law of sin and death being ended, and now we're under the law of the spirit of life, mm -hmm. okay? Love is our standard, uh, not perfect law keeping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm up on all that. Regardless of that, I was inclined to look at those verses in First John as a, a pattern, mm -hmm. okay? But now I, I, I'm more inclined to think that you're right. You can see the clear dichotomy that's being made by John, I think, mm -hmm. in this letter. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and he understood that dichotomy that you mentioned right. between of the law and grace. You know, and it's like it's like Paul. How many times did Paul clearly state, right. where there is no law, there is no sin. Right. You know. So and knowing that and having that piece, it's like I, Paul, I'm telling you. It, when I came to across that verse, 
And I had, in the back of my mind, I had going, where there is no law, there is no sin. John 3, 9. 1 John 3, 9. He that is born of God well, if you does use not sin. Construct, Duh. <laughs> if you use Paul's construct from Romans mm-hmm. and Galatians, and you apply it to this, it's completely objective. Mm-hmm. Now, to hold to these verses speaking of a pattern, that's implementing assumption, clearly. Mm-hmm. Because that can't be, you know, it's just not definitive. It's, it's the presentation of assumption. Right. Right. And verse 8 is the, verse 8, I'll go back to that. Verse 8 is the clear, is the contrast of that. Because mm-hmm. why did we, why is he that commits sin of the devil? That's a description of, an un, of a lost person. Why does he commit sin? Why is there sin? Mm-hmm. Because he's under the law. Right. So being under the law, every transgression is a sin. Right. It is sin because the law condemns him. Right. But once you pass from death unto life and you're born again, the law's ended. How can you how can you sin if there is no sin? It and it's you know, it becomes perfectly clear. I can't think of the number of times I struggle. I've had discussions with people on first John three nine. And what that means. Right. And just struggling and struggling to try and understand that. And then all just, like I said, when I was preparing this lesson, I came to that verse. It was just like, it was a right. no-brainer. Right. So, one more piece falls into place. <laughs>